The Legal Corner podcast series. Welcome to today's episode of The Legal Corner, a podcast which covers a variety of legal issues to keep you informed. Hosted by attorney at law Colin Dinoon and communication specialist Leonardo Torres. Welcome back to another episode of the Legal Corner podcast series. It's great to be with you guys again. Leonardo is working a lot these days, so he isn't here again, but he will be joining us at some point shortly during the course of the season. We're going to be looking at the legislative process in today's episode. Now, as we all know, Trinidad and Tobago is a unitary state which is regulated by a constitutional democracy which means that our constitution is the supreme law of the land. However, the Parliament of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago is the chief lawmaking body in the land, and it is modeled after the Westminster system, which obtains in the United Kingdom and throughout the Commonwealth. Joining me on the show today to provide some perspective on this topic is Ms. Chantal LaRoche, an attorney at law, and Senior Legal Officer at the Parliament of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Just to tell you a bit more about her, Chantal LaRoche is an attorney of 12 years standing and a graduate of the Hugh Wooding Law School. As Senior Legal Officer of the Parliament's Legal Unit, Ms. LaRoche provides apolitical advice to the presiding officers and members of Parliament to support them in the performance of their parliamentary duties. She is also responsible for providing corporate legal advice and services to the Parliament's administrative management and staff. She also holds a master's degree in business administration with specialized electives in leadership, entrepreneurship, and innovation. An experienced lecturer and tutor, Chantal has also served as a facilitator trainer for the national and regional youth parliaments as well as several lectures, workshops and seminars on the process of lawmaking, the standing orders and gender sensitive parliaments and budgets. Chantal loves to travel, is a fitness enthusiast and is avidly involved in charitable work. At present she is a board member for two local non-profit organizations. The student and professional organization of Trinidad and Tobago and the Anglican Board of Education. So good day to you, Chantal, and welcome to the Legal Corner. Thank you, Colin, for introducing me and as well for inviting me to your podcast, your great podcast, which gives a lot of education in the legal sphere. And I've admired the podcast for some time, so it is my pleasure to join you to talk a bit about something that I think I am qualified to give some information on. Thanks for having me. So it's an honor of mine to have you here because mm -hmm. I would have looked at your interview on uh, Strictly Legal, which is hosted by Mr. Donawa, and you really did an exceptional job. So I know that you will do a fantastic job with today's topic. I will try my best. <laughs> so we're going to get right into it. I want you to talk to us a bit about the structure of the parliament. Sure. So the structure of parliament in Trinidad and Tobago is a bicameral structure or system. As you would have said in your introduction, we do follow the Westminster system of parliamentary govern governance here. And so very similar to the United Kingdom, we are bicameral, meaning we are made up of two chambers or two houses in parliament. So the parliament, which is the lawmaking arm of the state, entrusted with that responsibility to make laws for good governance in Trinidad and Tobago, is established in the constitution and it's established at section 39. And in the constitution, it actually says that the parliament shall consist of the president, which is the president of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, the Senate, and the House of Representatives. So that's where you get the structure for the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago from. It's actually entrenched in the Constitution. So Parliament consists of the President, the Senate, which people love to call the Upper House, 
and the House of Representatives. So um, the Senate, um, I don't know if most people would be aware or familiar by now, but if you are not, the Senate is our um, group of appointed members of parliament. They have not been elected, but rather they are appointed. Some are appointed by the government, some by the opposition leader, and some by the president of the, Sen um, the, president of the Republic, which is our independent senators, and they number 31. So you have 15 government senators, six government, um, six opposition senators, and nine independent senators to comprise the Senate. And then the lower house or House of Representatives has 41 members. And that composition is opposition and government. And of course, the government is the majority in the House of Representatives. So that gives you a sense of how our parliament um, is structured. It is two houses, so we call it bicameral, and the president is a part of the legislature as well. What is the role of the speaker in the House of Representatives? So the speaker, um, and I'm going to use the term presiding officer interchangeably because some of the roles of the speaker of the House would also be similar for the president of the Senate. So the president of the Senate and the Speaker of the House are charged with presiding or governing or managing the proceedings of each house. So the Speaker of the House acts as the presiding officer over any proceedings happening in the House of Representatives or as the chairman of committees uh, if the committee goes into a committee of the whole or is in standing finance, the speaker acts as the chairman. And one of the main roles of your presiding officer is to enforce the rules and to ensure that there is order when members meet. I mean, of course, it's a, it's a parliament. It's not a, it's not a Sunday school, so they can get rowdy. And there are rules that govern how members speak, the order in which things go, when they can speak, what they can say, what they can't say. And so one of the main roles of your presiding officer is to ensure that members uh, observe and respect the rules of the um, house. And those rules, we call them standing orders. So each house has its own rules that governs how um, proceedings will happen. And this, the presiding officer may also be called upon to interpret these rules if um, any member thinks that a rule has been breached by another member. So um, interpreting standing orders um, or what we call rules of order um, and issuing practice directions, notes, and ensuring that generally um, there's order. Um, the presiding officer does not, does not participate in debates. Um, but the presiding officer does approve um, questions, approves items um, to be debated on the day itself. Um, in addition to that role in the chamber as the guardian of the privileges of parliament and to ensure that our proceedings are, are done properly, the, the presiding officers may also have some ceremonial roles so, for example, if the president of the republic is unable to perform his or her duties or out of the country, it is the president of the Senate who acts as president of the republic. And uh, in addition to that, if the president of the Senate is not available, then the next person would be the Speaker of the House because they fall as numbers four and five on the table of precedence. Um, in terms of public uh, officials in Trinidad and Tobago. So in addition to their rules as uh, presiding within the chamber, there's also that rule, that ceremonial, and it's a constitutional rule as well. I'm going to segue into the lawmaking aspect of the, of the parliament. So how is a bill developed? So that's a, a, a good question. And oftentimes when we are training our youth parliamentarians here. We tell them uh, if every human being in Trinidad and Tobago were to be orderly and follow all the rules, we would never have lawyers. There would be no need for laws, right? So one of the first places that a bill would come from is development. It starts with a legal problem or 
some issue in the society that needs to be solved. So a bill usually is uh, developed because someone in government has seen a need for a legislative solution to a problem. And this usually would start with a policy of some kind, a policy in some area. So let's say, for example, there's a need for a policy in relation to the use of firearms, because that's a, a topical one. There's an issue with uh, illegal firearms. There is an issue with fi how firearms are used or misused. So that's an area that perhaps uh, someone may see as needing some kind of policy. Do we allow every citizen to have a firearm? Is that the policy or is the policy no guns uh, in the society because you want a, a non-violent uh, country. So the first step is to, to see what the issue is that needs to be legislated and to develop a policy in relation to that need. That usually starts in the particular ministry that has responsibility for whatever the area is. So if it's firearms and it's crime, then you're looking at national security. If it's education, it's the Minister of Education and so on. So a ministry is going to develop a policy to treat with whatever the legal issue is that needs to be resolved. This policy is then sent to cabinet for cabinet to approve this policy because your cabinet is who you have elected, who you have selected as the electorate to uh, develop all the laws that would guide and govern us. So as an executive, they sit they look at the policy and they need to approve it to see, does this indeed require legislative intervention? Do we want to do it now? Can it wait? Do we have something that's more pressing? Right. So they will look to see uh, what's the nature of the problem. Is it an economic problem? Is it a, a criminal, a crime problem? What are the relevant bodies that we need to consult? What's the history of this issue? Is firearms a new issue, an old issue? Do we have legislation already on the books? Right? Do we already have laws and are we just needing to enforce those laws or do we need to modernize what we have? All right? So all of this discussion and conversation is going to happen. And then the line ministry, once a policy is settled, is going to consult with the state drafting attorneys who are the uh, office of the chief parliamentary council. So there is a group of specialist attorneys who draft legislation for a living who are going to move that policy and to draft a, 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 a piece of legislation, a draft legislation, a draft law. And so then that, uh, once that draft is done, it's then assessed by uh, the LRC, which is the Law um, Review Committee, <clears throat> a group of technocrats, and the drafters and the policymakers sit together with some ministers to decide, is this the bill that we want to take forward? And so they are looking to see, is it sound? Does it make sense? Does it fit in with other laws? Are other laws are going to be amended by this one? And a detailed study happens to ensure that whatever is being drafted really fits into the landscape of the laws that we already have. We also look to, they will also look to see if we are adhering to any international treaties, um, is there any constitutional issues to be dealt with, and of course, are there any practical issues that may arise from, uh, you know, if, for, for example, if you say you want a firearm for every house, what's the practicality of that? We don't have enough firearms, we don't produce our own firearms, right? So all of those things will be assessed. So that's how um, a bill is developed, so it's from policy to draft, and then um, it's finalized after some discussion and assessment of the legislative proposal. And then it goes back to cabinet, and cabinet will decide if they are uh, happy with or pleased with the draft uh, or proposed legislation that's about to be sent to parliament. And who determines when a bill is actually brought before the parliament? So that is a decision of your executive or your cabinet. Cabinet must approve um, that bill when it's sent to them. And after it is approved, cabinet determines when by sending a notice to parliament with the bill. And it would usually inform whether it is to be placed on the order paper or agenda 
um, and, and it would also indicate whether uh, it's going to be um, for Im immediate placement or placement at the order paper of the next week, etc. But it's cabinet that decides that. At this point, we'll take a quick break and we'll be right back. Welcome back and thank you for staying with us. Chantal, before the break, you were talking to us about the fact that it is the cabinet who decides when a bill actually comes before the parliament. I want us to talk now about the process. So what is the process of the debate in the lower house? All right. So once that bill gets to parliament, it's placed on the order paper, which is in essence a, an agenda of what business is going to be considered by parliament. And so it's placed there and it must go through several stages before it becomes law. So as you, your question, asked, it's a process, it's stages. And what these stages are really, each one, it provides a different opportunity each time <clears throat> for consideration of the bill itself. There are opportunities to consider the merits and demerits. There are con uh, opportunities to consider the nitty gritty or the language, right? So each time is a, a time to reconsider and look to make sure that whatever is your final product is what parliament really, really wants. The very first stage in the process is the first reading of the bill. And at that stage, there is no debate. All you're doing is letting the public know that this bill is, be, is coming to Parliament, it's coming soon. So it's read aloud, its short title is read aloud in whichever house it's introduced into. So it's read a first time and introduced. Some bills go to the Senate first, some go to the House first. That's also determined by Cabinet. And it's usually a matter of balancing um, the, you know, the schedule, seeing uh, where there is uh, space and time for um, things to move. Right, but the very first thing is introduction and first reading. The bill is published and there's no debate. And there is a, it has to sit there before it is, uh, gets to the next stage, which is second reading, which is where all the excitement happens. That's where the debate on the general merits of the bill is going to occur. So let's say, for example, we have uh, they had the fire, um, Firearms Act bill recently. That would have been read a first time and introduced in the House of Representatives. And then second reading happened, right? So it's in the same one house. Uh, and at that stage is where the government or the, uh, the minister who is in charge of the bill, which is the minister whose portfolio the issue comes under, will explain to the other members why we need this legislation, right? So he would come on and say what the legislation proposes to do. He would give some of the policy considerations that would have led to us uh, having leg a legislative proposal in the first place. And then, of course, his colleagues will join in either in support of or in opposition of the proposal, right? So second reading is really debate time. Um, the next stage, the next usual stage is committee stage, which is where the committee of the whole house dissolves itself into a kind of a meeting style after second reading has been completed to go through the bill's uh, details, clause by clause. So if ever you're looking at the parliament channel and you'll see someone at the table with the presiding officer going through clause one, Clause two, clause three, that's really a committee, it's considered a committee meeting, right? Now, alternatively, if uh, there is uh, a lot of detail to be um, considered or a bill is considered to be very technical, 
it can be referred to a joint select committee before it gets to debate, or it can be referred to a joint select committee if we realize during the debate, now nah, this is too much to do on the floor of parliament. So there are a couple opportunities for a bill to be sent off to a committee. Um, it can be a joint select, meaning it's some members of each house, or it can be a select group of members from one house. They go off and they further examine that bill. Right? So there are opportunities between the stages for a bill to be sent off to a joint select committee and come back. Right? But the usual course of uh, uh, the process is first reading, second reading, and then committee stage. And then once that committee of the whole has considered that bill, it will report or it will go back to the House and say, what has happened when we were in committee stage? Did we make any amendments or changes, etc.? And then once that's done, you get to your third reading or final approval stage before it is passed. <clears throat> so those are the stages or steps. First reading, second reading, committee stage report, third reading, and passage. But that's just in one house. Because we are bicameral, you must also go through these same stages in the next house. So if your bill started in the House of Representatives, like the firearms bill would have started on Friday, on Tuesday, it comes over to the, to the Senate to go through that exact same process. First reading, second reading, etc. And as I said before, it's an opportunity again. If the House didn't pick up on an issue, the Senate may pick up on something. Right, And so it's another opportunity to consider the principles, the merits, the details, etc. Right, So in each house, it's the same processes, and you must go from one to the other house in order for the process to be complete. Right, In terms of the committees uh, that you may see meeting from time to time, the joint select committees, if a bill is sent to a committee, it's usually sent with a timetable or a deadline for the committee to come back with its findings. So uh, a committee may be given a three-month period, six weeks, two months, to go off and come back. And then again, once the committee comes back, all of those steps must be followed um, before we get to um, uh, third reading and passage. So once the bill is passed, then um, you know there are some other steps to be followed, such as um, the publication of the bill, etc. But that, in a nutshell, is the process of um, lawmaking in both the House of Representatives and the Senate. Do the independent senators have any particular role or any special role? Their role is like any other member. They can debate uh, any particular bill that they wish. Um, what's unique about our independent senators is, unlike the members of the other benches, they are not uh, they are not considered to be a group. So they do not have to vote with each other, or they don't have to agree or vote in the same way. So a lot of times when you hear um, debates from the independent bench, they are all coming from varying perspectives. Whereas, of course, when members are uh, under the what we call the parliamentary whip they are expected to support whatever position their particular party or bench. So if the opposition is in opposition of a bill, you don't expect to hear an opposition member speaking in support of, right? The whip ensures that all of the members are, uh, as one of my the members likes to say, sir, you're singing from the same hymn sheet. So the independent senators perform a kind of an independent consideration that is not party-driven, and they usually are performing a, 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 an objective analysis of the bill, and they each come with their own unique perspectives on um, any legislation. So that, to me, is their role. They um, assess bills in a different way. They do not caucus, right? They, they, they are not considered to be a, a, a block of votes. They are all individual uh, votes in relation to uh, the Senate. What is the role of the president 
in the Lomican process. Right. So once you've gotten to third reading and passage of a bill in Parliament, the bill, uh, assent copies of the bill are prepared for the signature of the President of the Republic. The President actually physically signs with a pen and it's sealed. So at the front of a bill, it doesn't become an act until you see that signature and that red seal, meaning that the president is assenting. So uh, the final step, I, I didn't want to get ahead of you, and it's a good thing that I didn't. The very final step before a bill moves from being a proposal for law to be an actual law and having the status of law is when the president signs that bill. So it, it goes from being a bill to an act of parliament. And at that stage also, uh, what's not noteworthy at that stage as well is some pieces of legislation will come into effect immediately upon assent. So from the time the president signs, then that bill or that act becomes law. But for some pieces of legislation, there is a commencement section which says that the law does not come into effect until proclamation. And so even if the president signs and seals, if there is no proclamation yet, then that law is not yet um, in effect. So sometimes that's done if um, a government needs time for implementation. So if we're using firearms again, let's say there's a firearms amnesty and the government needs six months to set up where they will collect firearms from people, what's the logging procedure. If you go and you assent now and you don't give yourself that commencement period, then you may find yourself in problems. So some bills will have a commencement clause, which says that the particular law will come into effect upon proclamation, or it may say that it will come into effect on a particular date. So if we know we want what? it to come into effect by the 1st of January, then that will be in the bill. What does proclamation entail? Right. So proclamation is a declaration from the president that something... So it's done by legal notice, and it is a proclamation or a declaration that this act has come into effect on this date. So it's literally, it's published in the Gazette, and so that's when we would know that it's now in effect. As we get ready to close, talk to us about the cool idea of a, a special majority and um, in what situations does this arise and what exactly is meant by that term? Sure. So, not every bill, uh, and I think this is something that um, citizens may not appreciate, not every bill is going to come and tell you nice things. Some bills, some legislative proposals are coming to infringe your constitutional rights. I mean, it's great uh, that we have such an aware society that is aware of their rights and when it's going to be infringed. So when a bill is seeking to do something that may infringe your rights as a citizen, um, it must be passed by a special majority, meaning not just a simple majority of members. We need enough members to ensure that, yes, we agree in that this thing is so required that we are going to be infringing on your right to free movement or your right to assembly or your right to religion, right? It has to be, we have to know that not just half of the members were okay with this. We need to know that uh, three quarters were okay with infringing this particular right. And so in Section 54 of the Constitution, you will find that uh, it outlines which types of majorities are required for laws infringing the various sections of the Constitution. So if it's infringing uh, certain entrenched provisions, you will find that the majority or the number of members required to agree right, to the bill is higher so some um, infringements required require a three-fifths, some is three-fourths, right? Some provisions, depending on how serious it is, will require a larger majority or a larger number of members to agree. And that's built in, into the Constitution 
to protect those very rights. You don't want it to be that on any given day, a government can come and infringe the very rights that are intended to protect you as a citizen. But that doesn't mean that they can't be infringed. It's just that there is a, a, a method or a mechanism to ensure that it's not done arbitrarily. And that's what uh, those special majorities are inbuilt there for. A former president once said that parliamentary sitting should begin at ETM. Do you have any thoughts on that in terms of the length of time for debate? No, no, and... no, 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 not ATM, not, a, not ATM, not, <laughs> not with the uh, current um, traffic situation. As we would never start on okay. time. Um, right. I do understand, though, um, we, what, we, what needs to be appreciated, though, is many of our members of parliament are doing this part-time. Uh, again, I don't think that's something that citizens appreciate. Many of these members have their own jobs, um, and this is time, uh, public service that they are giving. And so to in order for us to move to that, I mean, we can, we then have to um, pay our parliamentary members as full-time parliamentarians. And that's a conversation that I, I don't know if um, we're ready for, but in order to get more time out of our parliamentarians, we have to pay them for it. Um, many of these people are running their own businesses, legal practices, dental practices, and are coming here, not just on sitting days, because we're also asking them to come and sit on joint select committees as well. And, and it can be time consuming. And then you want them to research because you don't want them to come here and debate off the top of their heads, right? So maybe not 8 a.m., Maybe one day we can start at 10 a.m. Um, because, of course, uh, the, the length of the debate and the quality, if we had more time, may, maybe that would, be, that would change. But um, as it is right now, many, several of our members are part-time, and I don't think that's a, 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 a reasonable expectation in the, the current scenario, maybe in the future. Right. Now, I know the parliament has ways in which the public can access it. So, for example, there's a public gallery, there are displays and stuff like that. So talk to us a bit about the accessibility of the parliament to the citizenry. Yes, yeah, so my, my boss uh, has a saying, uh, parliament belongs to the people, and I endorse that. I, I, I think, um, I remember before I would tear this building, because I, I, I would have looked at the Red House before we, Refurbished. It seemed like such an imposing, big, scary place that the average citizen could not enter. And it's far from. We do have a rotunda now that we have refurbished. We have a rotunda space where members of the public and people come up to me, they see me and they're like, can I come in here? Um, and yes, it's open to the public. You can come in, you can view the, there's an art exhibition and the exhibit changes every month. Um, in the rotunda space. In addition to that, we do conduct tours of the chambers um, on days when there are no sittings. Uh, that usually happens on a Thursday. Um, of course, we would have paused during COVID, but that those have been resumed. So members of the public who may wish to um, go on a tour are free to do so. And um, in addition to that, Yes, you can come and sit in a public gallery and view the sitting. Um, it's open to the public as well. Um, there are some rules, of course, in terms of how you're dressed um, and, and stuff like that. But uh, we, we do encourage one, one very major element of what we do here is public outreach and public education. And so we are very, very happy when members of the public show interest in the activities happening here. So, yes, it's open. You can come. You could come and sit in the member of wherever you're from, that constituency. You could sit in a chair, you could take photos. And on a regular day, you can also come into the Rotunda Gallery. Is there a dress code for coming into the Rotunda Gallery? Um, no, it's not, a, it's, not a, well, it's not a strict dress code. But there are a couple of rules in terms of uh, shorts and that kind of thing. But um, if you're casual, if that's what you mean, you can come in a T-shirt once, um, once you are dressed decently i want to say but it's not business you're not required to be in business attire to come into the rotunda gallery i know there is the youth parliament because i myself was involved in youth parliament however ironically 
I became ill around the time when we were preparing and had to actually have the final day. But I was actually the research assistant for one of my um, fellow students at San Fernando Government Secondary. So talk to us a bit about this whole uh, National Youth Parliament for young persons who may be interested. How can they become involved and what are the benefits of serving in the Youth Parliament? Well, I'm so sad that you missed out on the opportunity of your lifetime. Um, at, at least you still found your way to law, which is good, because many of the youth parliaments who come, parliamentarians who come, do have an interest in either politics or law. Um, the youth parliament program is one of my, my, my projects, my passion projects since I started working here. Um, we run the national youth parliament on an annual basis. It is an opportunity for young persons. It's expanded over time. So it used to be uh, targeted at secondary school students, but we've since expanded and we have some tertiary level students. And we've also started inviting some of the youth groups. So like the police youth clubs and some of the youth organizations have also um, been invited to participate. We try to alternate the organizations and schools so that not one school is dominating every year. Um, so, for example, the year I participated, my school was not invited, right? It, you know, to ensure that there's a, a spread of students, right? Because, you know, if you give certain schools a chance, they'll come every year and they'll send 100 students, right? But we try to make it, you know, fair and balanced and to give some students who may not necessarily get the exposure the opportunity to come and participate in the debates, um, it's a sometimes six to eight week program. We train them in parliamentary procedure, use of the standing orders, debating skills. Um, and then we will have a debate on the day of the, um, the youth parliamentary debate day where they will get an opportunity to stand in the chamber like a member of parliament and debate on a particular issue. It's a shorter debate, so the speaking time is shorter. Um, but it really is uh, a pleasure to see some of the students who've come from that um, system, how much they've grown. Many of them are practicing attorneys. Some of them have become members of political parties. And so it's really one of those um, programs that we are, we are proud of here. We've also um, partnered with CWIL, which is the Caribbean uh, Women in Leadership Group, to do two young women in leadership debates. So those um, parliamentary debates were women, young women only. Those were ex excellent as well. And during the pandemic, we had our first virtual youth parliament. That was an experience because the day of the debate was the day we had the nationwide internet blackout. But, you know, all of those, uh, <laughs> their, their growth opportunities, their learning opportunities, and, and, and their fun, you know. So uh, we really do love and and the students love it some if we say we're not having one we will get calls from schools and students we get calls asking how do i sign up next year so it's something that the students really really love Chantal, thanks a lot for taking the time to be with us today and i wish you all the very best thank you again for inviting me the time went i didn't think we would have so much to talk about uh you know because i'm doing this every day so i think to myself yeah by 10 minutes, we'll run out of things to talk about. But thank you so much for the invitation. And, and I wish you all the best with this amazing podcast. You have a gem on your hands. So I look forward to seeing who your next guest is. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to the Legal Corner podcast series. For more information, please visit us at our Facebook or Instagram pages or send your comments to the Legal Corner Podcast at gmail.com. We look forward to hearing from you.